Tonight is the culmination of the sixth annual McMinnville Short Film Festival, the biggest and most successful one yet. More films were submitted this year, a greater diversity of films, with almost half from international sources, but a festival that validates the remarkable filmmaking talent right here in the Pacific Northwest. My name is Jeff Sargent, and along with my colleague Walter Height, we will be your MCs this evening. We're kind of like your Laurel and Hardy or Abbott and Costello team up here, switching back and forth. <laughs> Not Sunny and Cher. <laughs> Walt's a better singer than I am, though. Um, tonight is an opportunity to recognize the outstanding short films that were evaluated by our judges, two community organizations, and one local celebrity. But before we get to that, and our keynote speaker for the evening, we need to thank the many individuals and organizations who have made this evening possible, and this entire weekend possible. First, it's our sponsors, who you can find in the program, or who were shown before the screenings. Our wonderful sponsors provided dollars and in-kind donations, like food and wine, to bring us this evening. Also, Coming Attractions Theater and Chemeketa Community College for providing the first class facilities that we have here this evening. Our guest speakers that we had at some uh, filmmaker education sessions earlier today, including Dustin Morrow and Tara Johnson Mettinger, and our filmmaker Q&A panel, which featured Mike Wellens, Phil Guzzo, and Ray Nomoto Robeson. So we are grateful to them. And our judges for the festival, that included yours truly, Walt, Kevin Smith, Carolyn Brackett, Bracken Franzoni, and Todd Logan and our many volunteers, who I can't possibly name them all, but they provided vital support, such as taking and selling tickets, handing out the programs, helping us set up for this uh, event here tonight. We're grateful to them. And our film festival members as well. You can actually be a member of the McMinnville Film Festival. You can find out more in your program or going to McMinnvilleFilmFest.org for information. We'd love to have you do that for next year and our McMinnville Film Festival Board of Directors, which should appear up here. Um, the most significant name or names on that list are our founders, visionaries, and the heart and soul of the McMinnville Short Film Festival, Dan and Nancy Morrow. And finally, Perhaps, perhaps most importantly, the reason that we're here. Our creative, inspirational, and sometimes slightly twisted filmmakers <laughs> who entertained us. I'd like all the filmmakers to please stand now for appreciation. <laughs> now, for our keynote speaker this evening. David Kress. Let me find his bio. He's a swell guy. I met him earlier this evening. <laughs> David is an optimist and award-winning media producer who has worked in all genres of filmmaking. He is currently producing the seventh season, correct, of Portlandia, the Emmy-nominated and Peabody-honored show. This past year, David was nominated along with his producing partners for Best Comedy Emmy. Before Portlandia, David was executive producer on Gus Van Zandt's feature film, Restless, and also produced Van Zandt's American Spirit Award-nominated film, Paranoid Park. He's a founding partner and executive producer of Food Chain Films, which has created nationally recognized advertising and music video spots. And in television, film, or music, David just finds a way to get it done. Whether it's bribing a crew into an ancient monastery in the mountains of Greece, or shutting down a major freeway in Argentina to get that right shot. I'd like to hear about those stories. <laughs> Please welcome David Kress. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I want to make a few excuses and apologies up front. Uh, 
I had something I wanted to talk about and felt like I understood pretty well. And then I started thinking about it, especially late in the day yesterday, and thought this crowd might be a little too diverse for that. And, um, and I thought, I still have something I can tell these folks uh, that'll be useful to a wider range, but it means I'll probably have to read the remarks. Now, I know what it feels like when someone's reading their, their remarks to you, and it's terrible. So I'm going to apologize, but just bear with me because the reason I feel like I need to do it is it's fairly convoluted. It's barely even tied together organizationally. I want to get through it, so then I have some time to do a Q&A with you. I'll cover a lot, and if there's something I miss for any of you, please feel free to ask the question. But let me get through it first, OK? <clears throat> um, I, I am Emmy-nominated. Uh, just recently uh, lost the Emmy, and I thought to myself, is McMinnville going to not have me? <laughs> uh, after I thought I had in also a really bad thought for Key and Peele, who won. But, uh, <laughs> but that's over now, and they do have a great show. So and I'm happy to be here. And I, shorts are so important, and they're becoming even more important. And it's great that we live in this world where the shorts can have a really long life. It's very, things are very searchable, and they show up. Well, on the internet, and, it, and I made shorts myself, and I, I really think it's a great genre. So I'm happy that McMinnville's doing this festival. Uh, I'm very happy to be at this nice college, and thanks to everybody for having me. So, <clears throat> remarks. Don't quit your day job. We've all heard that, right? It's not necessarily bad advice, but today I'd like to help you with a problem I get asked about a lot, maybe familiar to some of you here. It has variations, but usually goes something like this. David, people compliment me all the time on my short film, but no one wants to pay me to do more work. Today I'm hoping to offer you some helpful advice about how you can translate the experience of making your short films or other passion projects into practical paying work. I'll do this by breaking the media professions and fields into some broad categories and attempt to define them. After that, I'll talk about some points of entry into those categories for directors, writers, and producers. These tips really apply to any style of filmmaking, animation, documentary, live action, even VR. The first thing to realize is that most media careers are really tournament jobs, meaning that many people compete and only the better, more determined folks rise to positions that are well paying. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that all these categories that we'll be referring to here all are really highly competitive. We have all heard the term tournaments, right? It's a word associated with sports, and that's not a bad analogy. And then another analogy expressed this way is drug dealing. <laughs> <laughs> An economist uh, studied drug gangs in Chicago and discovered that most entry-level drug dealers didn't even make minimum wage. Most lived at home. They did it because they looked at the dealers at the top of their career pyramid and hoped one day to make all of that cash and have that respect. Does that sound like any filmmakers you know? <laughs> we can all blame the internet for this imbalance. The same technological advances that made it easy for you to shoot and edit your short film on relatively cheap gear have applied equally to all would-be filmmakers. Besides the advances in digital technology, we also live in the information age that the internet spawned. This allows people to learn about careers that would have not seemed practical a decade or two ago. It makes it possible to learn advanced software and film techniques. I'll bet a lot of you here have learned a few tricks from watching YouTube videos or taking a lynda.com tutorial. Economists call this a low barrier to entry field. This essentially means it's going to be hard. You'll need to be strategic, and you will likely need to be diligent, unless you're related to someone already in the business, in which case I'd like to talk to you after the remarks. <laughs> <laughs> so the new digital world has been a mixed bag. It's easier to make films than ever, and that's created a real supply and demand problem. More people than ever want to work in media careers. This helps to explain why your path is going to have to be different than many of your filmmaking heroes. Studying the career paths of Spike Jones, Gus Van Zandt, or Kevin Smith is limited in terms of a useful model to career advancement. Their careers were largely created pre-digital. 
We need to look at other ways to find a career path now. It's complicated by the fact that it's very much a continuing and ongoing evolving ecosystem. How does one break through and find a satisfying paying gig in this new era? For the purpose of this discussion, I'll break the paid media categories into four groups. Fine art, new media, commercial, and entertainment. I'm going to spend more time on the last two, but it's worth touching on the first two. Fine art. I define fine art as content made to sell for the sheer enjoyment of that content. It's often sold in galleries or commissioned to play in a commercial space. New media, this is content that primarily plays on a digital format. Entertainment, for our purpose today, is work that plays on a variety of formats like television or film, and it's, and it's mostly advertising supported or paid for by the production company or networks who commission it. Commercial work is best exemplified by the 30 second spot, but it's evolving and includes branded content and even sponsored short films. I'd also place music video into this category. After all, what's a music video but an advertisement for the record? The good news is that, this is an entry, that there is an entry point for all of these categories, regardless of where you are currently in your filmmaking career. Whether you've helped make a boatload of award-winning shorts and are on the high end of the spectrum, or you're just starting out and maybe you're here with your first film. People are hired depending by craft on a combination of work samples or the credits they obtained working on projects. Another term for work samples is real or portfolio. Credits are simply your work listed on a resume or IMDB page. <coughs> Generally, directors and writers are more dependent on work samples and producers more dependent on credits. But like most things in media, it's a little fuzzy and specific to the types of work and category. Now let's look at those categories and talk about the entry points. Start with fine art. Think of the work of Christian Marclay or Oregon's own Matt McCormick. As a director in this world, I'd start talking to the gallery owners and ask them about what kind of work is, uh, is drawing interest from buyers. I don't want to spend too much time in this category because I like to think of fine art work as a calling, not really something that one does for the money. Uh, but I also like to think Trump's going to lose by a landslide, so I'm, I'm overcome with magical <laughs> thinking a lot. So on the new media, um, I'm also going to do this one pretty quickly. One issue that characterizes new media is that work involves a generally smaller audience. That content is often made by people with multiple skills, jacks of all trades, sometimes doing the shooting, editing, even final color and sound themselves. Uh, now, this is certainly not always true. The brands whose work is lifestyle related or have a history of great work will not skimp. Nike or Apple will not have the same tolerance for a crappy video that Yelp will on their website. Uh, but the majority of web work is not at the highest level. Uh, besides, I really want to talk more in depth about commercial and entertainment categories because I think there's the greatest number of well-paying jobs. That's where they're going to be created. Now, commercial work, points of entry. Commercial and music video directors are usually represented by production companies. This is where it gets a little boring, guys. If you had a reasonable portfolio of work, you would shop your reel to various production companies and sign an exclusive deal to have them represent you. These production companies have reps for music videos and spots, and when an agency has a spot to make, they would assign an in-house agency producer to research and recommend directors to the creative team who's conceived the campaign. At some point, the agency producer will find a minimum of three directors that the creative team thinks would be good for the job, usually through a process of conference calls where the directors and the agency creatives can discuss the ideas, evaluate the directors based on their reels and their take on those ideas, scripts or storyboards, and invite them to bid the job. The same type of thing happens with music videos. A record label would have an artist with a song, and the music video commissioner or label would put out a request to have directors do treatments for songs. Those treatments would be evaluated by the artists themselves along with the label before choosing a director and then commissioning that work. Now this is changing a bit as the business model for advertising agencies is evolving. More and more agencies will serve as the production company and hire freelance directors and producers and create the content in-house. But most really costly and polished productions still get handed over to production companies. But this still represents the biggest opportunity for newish directors and producers who are not yet repped by production companies. 
The tricky part here is to build a competitive reel that can get the attention of the production companies and the advertising agencies. For the more of you, for the more, for, for, for the people here who are more advanced on the spectrum, you can use a combination of your passion projects to create that reel. One important note, even if you have an extensive amount of award-winning short films, it's still likely not enough to interest a production company or get the green light from an agency producer. You see, when you do your own short film or doc or music video, a savvy agency producer will know that. There's a big difference between that and doing a commission piece of work, basically interpreting someone else's story. They need to see that you've done that, that you have some experience doing that. Now you can do spec pieces in a commercial style, but that has the same limitation. You thought up the work, it's not interpreted work. You need some work that's interpreted to gain their confidence. I have a few recommendations here. One is to seek out a nonprofit or an agency doing pro bono work and offer to do some work for free. Now I know I've been talking about paid work, but remember this is a tournament career. <laughs> Why would anyone pay you to do work they could pay someone else who's already proven they can interpret that work at that high level? Basically, they'll do it because doing it for free or low dollars means low risk. That's where you will start unless you have something great you have done and they want to incorporate that style. Um, some of you may know the director, Shell White. He's an example of someone who started in this respect. Shell, uh, early in his career, made an award-winning short called The Photocopier Cha-Cha-Cha. It's done in the cut paper style of animation. Uh, it's really great. Shell did all the work, almost all the work, including writing the music. He's kind of a genius. Um, but someone in an ad agency saw that piece of work, maybe at a festival like this one, and they had a client, Honda, that needed a spot done that would be eye-catching, so they commissioned him to do that spot. After he did that, and everyone went crazy for that great Honda spot, um, that wasn't as good as a short film, by the way, um, <clears throat> a production company saw that work and signed Shell, and he's been happily making all kinds of different media uh, for the next 25 years or so. But for those of you less developed with your portfolio or without the resources to do spec work, I would suggest some other ideas that I'll address after I talk about the entertainment category so don't feel like you're left out yet. Let me talk about producers in the commercial category. They usually move up to the ranks of the film crews, the freelance film crews, often starting as production assistants and working through the production ranks. I'm going to move through this, but if we want to talk about this in the q and I will, but entry level is usually intern or production assistant. On the manager side, that's production assistant, office coordinator, coordinator, production manager, producer, or on the set, or you can take a set route, second AD, first AD, production manager, producer. It's also, a, it's also possible to come at this job from the advertising agency side, usually starting at the agency as a runner or a broadcast assistant, then broadcast producer. It's a great field to be in if you love post and managing talent. Writers are almost always attached to the advertising agency or represented by talent agencies. Either way, again, it's work samples that you need, portfolio, real. You can do that writing on spec and learn through formal school or informal access. In general, you can refine your skills by reading professional publications catering to the category. In the commercial category, I recommend shoot, post, ad age, or creativity. By subscribing and reading this material on the regular, you can educate yourself to this market. Whether it's trends, technological advances, or hot, technique, hot techniques, it's all well covered in this journalism. I also would suggest you look at and join professional organization like Oregon's own OMPA. Wow. I'm a proud 15-year member. <laughs> Perhaps the Portland Advertising Federation or on the national level, the Association of Independent Commercial Producers. Do some strategic networking and research. Also, if you think it's warranted to do an informal, informational interview or take someone you admire to lunch to prick their brain, that's fine. Please understand their work product and their business well before doing that. If you don't already have a bunch of award-winning work under your belt, don't invite Dan Wyden to lunch. It's not the right time yet, but maybe invite someone who works for Dan who's working on projects you admire or you might realistically be able to aid them in. The key word there is realistic. Now on to entertainment. Entertainment may, may be the most like 
what you've been doing to get you here to the McMinnville Festival. Films and webisodes are still genres that original ideas uh, uh, are sold and, and valued. The high level work that you do here uh, can help you get representations by talent agencies or production companies. If that doesn't happen, maybe you can pursue your idea on a smaller scale like a webisode or podcast. Labs and festivals are also great ways to get, uh, to gain it, attention of agents. Television is, is a writer's medium, and even though there are some famous exceptions, most writers need to develop a peer group and also find representation in order to work. Television is a medium that's more writer-driven for the directors, and it's important they have work samples where they interpret other people's work again. Entertainment is a place that producers can enter the system in many different ways. Different from commercial work, entertainment is a category that producers can enter from the top down by interning at a talent agency or a big production company, or through the same bottom-up ranks that we talked about about commercial world. Um, <clears throat> uh, I started out as a PA, and that's how I did it. Another way to producing entertainment is by helping to birth a production or a talent and partnering with them. Again, it's that peer group. There's professional publications here as well. They include Movie Maker, Variety, Deadline, Hollywood, Post, and Creativity. So now I've addressed the four broad categories for those filmmakers who are fairly advanced but haven't made it yet to where they're getting paid exclusively for their work. Now I want to discuss entry point for those folks here who may not be as advanced. Uh, maybe you're just part of the crew, or the short you have here is your first one. One possible in seeking out employment doing, is doing support work. If you're at a place in your life you can work as a freelance crew member, that can be useful. It's great training as a director, writer, or producer to work in any of the creative technical fields, even at the lowest level. For example, you can learn a lot about directing, even by being a, a set PA, if you keep your eyes open and ears open. Watching other directors to work, uh, watching other directors direct can be some of the best training there is. You will see what works and see a lot of what doesn't work, and you can eliminate that from your directing style. Casting, locations, art department, all those crafts will make you a better director, producer, or writer. Uh, perhaps none more so than editing. All the good producers I know had lower level support jobs prior to producing at the high level. Whatever you do, it's important to build up that peer group. Now, even if you have no experience, there's a route forward. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got, and this was before my film career, was to try to find the five most interesting people in whatever organization you're part of. School, work, volunteer group, whatever organization. Find the four or five people doing the best, most interesting work. Once you've identified them, try to be as much help to them as you can be. That really was the key point for me, learning to seek out talented people and to help them. Even if the only five talented people you know are all directors, where you can all just uh, rotate crew positions and make each other spec, spec stuff. Again, I think, it's professional, I think it's important to join professional organizations like the OMPA. The OMPA has been with me um, for my spot making career, for my music video making career, for my feature filmmaking career, and for my television career. So uh, that, that organization, if you live in Oregon, is a really good one. If you live in a different state or a different place, there's probably the equivalent, see? So get involved, start building that peer group. Uh, remember that you need to, to interpret other people's work, right? If you haven't done that, if you've been making your own stuff, well, maybe at, maybe at one of these meetings you'll meet a writer, and then you can interpret that writer's work and then have that checked off the list. I'd also tell you to start participating in webinars and production demonstrations, most producers budget and schedule. Even if you can't afford budgeting and scheduling software, you can get a free trial and attend a free online webinar. For spying writers, there are conferences, screenplays, competitions, and labs. Uh, if you want a success story example there, Mike Rich, um, probably a lot of you know that he won a screenplay competition and uh, was made into a movie, and then Gus Van Zandt made a movie with him. Okay, so that's it. We've broken down and covered entry points into the four categories of filmmaking careers they can develop in. Uh, I hope it wasn't too broad or too weird, and I'm open to questions.
Uh, how can you tell the difference between, uh, like I've got, I got an email out of the blue, uh, I'm not sure who it's from, but they said they liked the video I'd made, and they asked me to make something on spec, basically. It's been a while, but while you were talking, you reminded me of that, and it, at the time, it kind of uh, annoyed me that they'd want me to work for free, I hadn't heard of these people, but I'm new, maybe, maybe they were some important production company like you're talking about and how, how where do you draw the line between oh, these people are just taking advantage of me and they want me to do free work or maybe this is a great opportunity well yeah that's a good question i think what i do is i'd look hard at their website and their work and their work history and if their work history wasn't appealing to you or if it didn't feel like it was a place you wanted to go um then i'd pass on that and i'd go find something else to do yeah, well, I was just going to ask uh, if you had some uh, things that you learned going from uh, films of a short nature to going to a feature length. Any advice uh, or anything that, anything that you learned going from short to a feature? Um, well, I learned that features are harder um, and only because they last longer. Um, everything that I ever needed to know to make a feature um, besides a few uh, weird uh, corporate office politics, I learned from making short films. So the main thing is that I think a lot of people get hung up with their shorts by not thinking about fulfillment, their legal obligations, um, and sometimes uh, not really paying attention as much as they should to the accounting. And the reason is you want to be able to, the next time someone offers you a job, you know, you've, you're making your film dribs and jab, jabs of your own money whenever you have it, and you're not really keeping track of it. You really just want to cross that finish line, make that great film, and get the respect that you deserve. Um, but you should keep track of that money and how it's being spent, because the next time someone asks you to do something, and then they say, what do you want for a budget? You need to have some reference for that. So that's one thing I do, is I make sure I was keeping track of what things cost and what things might that I was giving away in kind. I'd probably sit down at the end of every project and think, what if I had to pay somebody or I wanted to pay myself to do this? What would that cost? That way you can answer that question more accurately. Uh, how does a writer uh, build a peer group to break in to the entertainment? Yikes, that's a hard one. <laughs> OK. so. There are some things like, um, oh shoot, what's the, um, Wordstock uh, has a, um, a, a, a section that's specific to screenwriting. I'd start n networking there. Um, there are writers groups that you'll, once you start getting into that networking, you can work in a writers group and there are writers groups in Portland that have people who've written screenplays that um, and share, want to share that experience and help critique your work and help you with that. Um, uh, but I think, you know, those kinds of, those kind of networking, that's really probably your best bet there. Also screenplay competitions. They're good because pe people start to notice you and then you go to those and you can sort of, the people, the other people are doing interesting work, you can start, start talking to. I have a question. Sure. Compare feature films, short films to television and, and which do you like better? What are the pros and cons of both? If somebody hadn't thought about television before. Well, for me, um, I, I'm sort of a, a tour guy and I think that comes from when I started in this business, I started making spots and music videos, and there's always a lot of cooks in the kitchen. You've got your creative director, your copywriter, um, your account people, who basically say make the logo bigger, <laughs> and, um, your, um, and your uh, art director, and you've got your director at, at the production company level. And one thing I thought of was how, you know, you'd read a great storyboard or a script and you'd think, wow, how much easier it would be to make something great if there weren't all these people talking. <laughs> uh, and so when you make a film, especially with a filmmaker like Gus Van Zant, uh, you know, to my great pleasure, I got that experience. It's really Gus's show, and that makes better films when there's fewer cooks in the kitchen. Now, for me now, the thing is that I most enjoy is working with people who need more help, and Gus doesn't need any help. <laughs> and nowadays, Fred and Carrie and John don't need any help. But when I first started on the show, 
they needed lots of help. So I felt very useful there, and I liked doing that. It's a, it's a different vibe, but I also very much miss commercials when I'm not doing commercials. There's a, a kind of manic energy uh, and a real tension of having to get it right. You may only have a day to do it. Uh, and people's careers are really on the line. For that, for that job, that job might mean everything to them. So I miss that when I, when I don't do those for a while, too. I know that the internship or the, peak, the production assistant position is a, a great entry point for young filmmakers to learn about filmmaking and get on the set. And I was wondering uh, a couple things. What, were you, what do you look for in a PA and an intern? What makes for a good PA? And what can they do while they're working with you to maximize that experience? Well, I like a 16 ounce coffee, cream, <laughs> and one and a half sugars on the rock. Uh, no, uh, uh, you really want people uh, who are open minded and energetic and really feel privileged to be there. Um, that's where I think the biggest, uh, the biggest disconnects come. Um, I'll often have someone uh, interning or PAing who's you know, got a great education, a real head on, a, on their shoulders, but kind of a chip on their shoulder that they're starting at the bottom. Um, uh, the thing I try to explain to everyone is, look around, everyone here started at the bottom. They all brought coffee or sandwiches. So it's not that big a deal that you're doing it. Um, but um, I, I have a sort of a process that I've developed over the years where I try to open people's minds up a little bit. I feel like in some ways our educational system makes bad PAs, makes bad filmmakers. Um, we're taught to do things by the numbers. We're taught to wait. Um, we're taught to ask a lot of questions and not take the initiative as much as we should be. And really what we're looking for in all our filmmaking partners, whether it's our sound people or our production assistants or our writers, is we're looking for people to work together well as a group, make that team effort, good communicators, and people who won't uh, necessarily take no for the answers. We're trying to make dreams come true here. Um, and that's one of the things I sort of try to, try to I try to, uh, the idea that there's limitations, I try to, to shake that out of all my new people. The faster they learn that, the faster they learn not to tell me no, <laughs> to work on getting that right answer, the faster uh, I'll start working for them. So say you found your five friends, your five auteurs, and what then, what, what, what are good ways to like break in, stick with them, and continue working with them? Well, you have to find that way. Like, that's the thing. Like, finding a way to contribute to that group, that's the, that's the genesis of your peer group, right? So um, at some point, you won't all be together. But perhaps something will happen like what happened to me, which was a really great co commercial director, Vance Malone, and I had worked on some projects together. And I, you know, he, he, he was the better filmmaker, so I assumed the producer role. And, um, and when Vance got, um, when Vance started doing casting, uh, he helped me get my first job. So, uh, you just find a way to become useful to, the, to those people and hope that they continue to do interesting work and better work and better and better work. And then hopefully what happens is you'll be moving up parallel to them. Uh, all you have to do is get on the IMDB page and go back a little bit and you'll start seeing this, this peer group thing is the major force in uh, work happening. Um, uh, it doesn't take, you know, start teasing it apart. Go back in people's histories and you'll say, and you'll see, oh my gosh, George Lucas worked with Steven Spielberg, you know, uh, right out of college at the, at the same studio. And you start to see these trends develop and they're almost all peer group. So um, start thinking about that. Um, if you're hanging around a bunch of losers, get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> No one wants to know what Fred eats for breakfast. <laughs> what, about, what about shutting down that freeway in Argentina? Yeah. OK, sometimes <laughs> it has to happen. Um, uh, when I've, I've worked in a, a, a lot of different countries, and it's always an experience. They have different levels of production. And we picked Argentina because 
we did a little web searching because the web was sort of new then, but we at least had it. And we found a production company in Argentina. We we're doing a spot for aspirin. Uh, and it was for the Latino market, so we needed people who could speak uh, Spanish, and we needed a place that had good weather and had an infrastructure to work with. So we picked Buenos Aires, and they had a freeway. And they had the reason we picked them and not Chile and not um, Brazil was because that, that town and that production company had uh, what's called a camera car and a process trailer. And the pictures of it, it looked great. It was shiny and new. This is a pretty technical piece of equipment because when you've got people going down the freeway, you, wanna, you don't want your actors dr driving a real car, although you'll have to do that. Sorry, guys. But <laughs> what happens at a certain point, your actors become too valuable that you can risk them or risk the lives of your other crew. So you put them onto a process trailer. And that's pulled by a specialty rig that um, uh, has uh, a generator on it so you can put lights on it and it'll support cameras so you can get really great shots. So I saw a picture of that and it looked great. <laughs> Uh, but then I got there, and things were tough economically, and the tires were all bald. It was shiny, but the tires were all bald. And, uh, and uh, my talent was pretty famous in Argentina. So I didn't think I could risk trying to have an open road or intermediate stop. So we, uh, we worked through the formal channels to close the road. And then when that didn't happen, we all went to the ATM machine, uh, withdrew as much cash as we could, and then made straight up bribes. <laughs> and we were able to close the, close the freeway, which made it safer for our talent, and we got the shot. Uh, we have uh, certificates of recognition for uh, all the filmmakers, each of uh, whose work was an official selection for this year's film festival. And uh, well, we'd like to present them at this time. So we're going to be scrolling uh, or showing on the screen uh, all of the official selections. However, I'm just going to be verbally announcing uh, the ones who are in attendance so that we can get through this portion of the program. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess we begin. Elise, you got the first list up there that we can see? Oh, I'm sitting through as you announce them. Ah, OK. Casey Klonsky. Woo! <laughs> Accepting on her behalf. No, we'll come back. We'll come back. So we'll move on to. We'll just move on? OK. <laughs> Moving on, uh, we had uh, one for uh, Endurance uh, with Bryn Landing, uh, Entangled, Jordan Roach, and uh, I guess I am announcing all of them. Uh, I Walk Everywhere, Ryan Walker. Okay, we'll bring back up Casey Klonsky for Love Unleashed. Um, we had one for a Jewish blind date with an ale morph, Reed's Motel, Carly Wincheman, and Lost, Michael Chen, and for we have one for someone who's here, Dear Future Self, Ray Nomoto Robeson. Other official selections were Billy the Kid by Sam Johnson, Carbon, Christian Lybrook, Stripes, Thibaut Pinsard, Kids for Kidnapping, Justin Zimmerman, Spectrata, Susan Mullen Wood. Hope I pronounced that right. Also, certificates for Chateau Sauvignon by David Muntz Meyer. And Harold the Hitman, Cosmo Spada. <laughs> Gorilla, Thibaut Pinsard. Shanghai Faders, A.J. Gordon.
After her, James Kim. <laughs> Certificates uh, are also for the dishwasher, Matt David Johnson, Wanderer, Mark O'Brien and Jake Wilkins, Awesome Beatles Color, Indra Sproge, Oregon's Oak, A Vanishing Legacy, Alex Hubsch, Hubsch. Pushing, Ryan Lapine, who was here and had to leave. Model Citizen, Phil Guzzo. Is Phil still here? <laughs> Phil had to leave too? Okay. The Dolphin Skin City, Pierre Gaffey. <laughs> Tone Journals, Edna Vasquez, Guy Baker. For Dad, Jason Rosenblatt. Pacifica, Brady Holden. And we also had certificates for the kids of Pearl, S. Kramer Herzog, and for Lost Girl, Tom Gentle. And so now we come to our first award of the e evening. This award is for Best Story. And the nominees this year for Best Story are Lost, For Dad, Stripes, Harold the Hitman, and Jewish Blind Date. And the award for best story this year goes to Lost. Michael's going to be very upset. He headed from Vancouver Island last night to catch the final ferry to drive all night to Portland to be here yesterday only to have the ferry cancel for mechanical reasons. So oh. he's going to be so sad that he won a category. So, yay for him. And now to present the award for best cinematography, please welcome back Jeff. <laughs> the sheet. Thank you, Walter. The nominees for best cinematography Includes Awesome Beatles Colors, Spectrata, Lost Girl, Oregon Oak, A Vanishing Legacy, and Lost. And the award goes to Spectrata by Susan Mullen Wood. All shot on her iPhone S, by the way, is that correct? Beautiful footage, thank you. Now, Walt is gonna come back to offer the best directing nominees and award. In the category of best direction, the nominees are Gorilla by Thibaut Pinsard, Jewish Blind Date, Anel Morph, Shanghai Faders, A.J. Gordon, for Dad, Jason Rosenblatt, and Pushing, Ryan Lapine. And the award for Best Direction goes to Shanghai Faders, A.J. Gordon. Do you have a phone I can use? Okay, time to go.
Come on up, Jeff. All right, here we go. See, you haven't Costello, or whatever I said before. Um, now I'm going to uh, present one of the special uh, community group awards, the Sunrise Rotary Award. I'd like to ask the president of the Sun McMinnville Sunrise Rotary Club, Larry Strober, to join me up front. Right here. Up right up here, please. Yes. The Sunrise Rotary Award is presented annually to recognize outstanding achievements by an Oregon-based filmmaker. Whether a first-time filmmaker or a seasoned veteran, the films produced by these local artists are judged by members of the McMinnville Sunrise Rotary Club at a special viewing session out at the Hillside Retirement Home with popcorn. <laughs> it's very nice. Lots of popcorn. Yes. <laughs> so the nominees for this award include Love Unleashed by Casey Klonsky, Endurance by Bryn Lanning, Dear Future Self by Ray Namoto Robeson, Kids for Kidnapping by Tony Maurer, Harold the Hitman by Cosmo Spada, Shanghai Faders by A.J. Gordon, Oregon's Oak, A Vanishing Legacy by Alex Hoipscht, Model Citizen by Phil Guzzo, Tone Journals, Edna Vasquez by Guy Baker, Four Dad by Jason Rosenblatt, and Pacifica by Brady Holden. And I will let Larry announce the award winner. Well, the award, which includes a check for $200, and the question to be answered is, did she or didn't she, goes to Jason Rosenblatt. <laughs> Okay, I said I was gonna do this, so gonna do it. Let's see, it's Monday. I just got home. It's the first day back at school and everybody's really nice. Like nice to the point of being creepy. It's like everything everybody does is because your dad's in a coma. So now I am literally looking forward to doing math homework. I just said that out loud. And you know, now it kind of feels like you're faking this whole thing because this is what you really wanted. the entire budget, huh? <laughs> Very nice film, thank you. And now for the uh, Will Vinton Awards. Will Vinton was our keynote speaker last year. And as soon as I find the sheet of paper that I had about that award, here it is, thank you. <laughs> McMinnville native and Oscar award winner Will Vinton honored us by allowing us to name an award after him. All animated film entries are considered for this award with the top candidates sent to Will Vinton for review. And this award also includes a cash prize. The nominees this year for the best animated film include Awesome Beatles Colors and Entangled. And the Will Vinton Award for best animated film goes to Awesome Beatles Colors. Walter? <laughs> we have another special award to present. It's called the Recology Sustainability Award. Uh, Recology's vision is a world without waste. This employee-owned company carries out its vision through community-based services, educational programs, and innovative engineering solutions that promote the three R's. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. The 2016 Recology Sustainability Award will go to a filmmaker who demonstrates and promotes environmental sustainability as a major theme in their short film. Themes can include, but are not limited to, natural resource conservation, waste reduction outreach and education, sustainable product production, use, and management. The nominees 
for the Recology Sustainability Award are Oregon's Oak, A Vanishing Legacy, and Pacifica. And the Recology Sustainability Award this year goes to Pacifica. And now for our final award of the evening, the Grand Jury Prize. This is the film that was rated the highest in total points by all of the judges for this year's film festival. And the nominees include Gorilla, Awesome Beatles Colors, Pushing, Lost, and Shanghai Faders. And the award for the 2016 McMinnville Short Film Festival's Grand Jury Prize goes to Gorilla by Thibaut Pinsard. Jungle Jenna! I know you're crazy about that thing. Hey, what, you and me? We get to look up at the stars. We don't get to have one. A stuntman and a starlet? It doesn't match. The award will be shipped to France for <laughs> Mr. Pinsard. I'm sure he will be delighted. Oh. Très bien. <laughs> that concludes our dinner and award ceremony and our McMinnville Short Film Festival this year. We hope that all of you, especially you directors, will consider making more films and entering them in the film festival next year. And we wish you the very best in your continued pursuit of filmmaking excellence. Thank you all for coming.